Hi, I'm David Nuremberg, the Leon Levy Professor and Director of the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, yes, it is the most marvelous job in the world. And I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you in Wolfenson and to the many of you who are live streaming this wherever in the world you are. We're gathered here today for discussion on steering AI for the public good, which is a topic that has suddenly come to feel urgent for a great many people, maybe eight billion people, I, I don't know, that might be only a slight exaggeration, for whom AI is actually a new and unfamiliar tool. But our panelists, on the other hand, have been immersed on the sub in the subject for quite a while. They've uh, joined us from an Institute for Advanced Study, henceforth I'm going to say IAS to avoid taking too long, for an IAS working group on AI policy and governance pursued in collaboration with DeepMind. Over the past three days, they, our panelists, and other computer scientists, social scientists, technology developers, and policymakers have been focused on drafting a response to the AI Accountability Policy Request for Comment, RFC, issued by the U.S. National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. Okay, that, <laughs> that may sound technical, uh, but all of us at the Institute, and indeed every human, and also I'm pretty confident, non-human life form on the planet, have something at stake in their work. Let me try to make the point of the stakes through a comparison with an earlier moment in the history of technology and the history of the Institute. So yes, as director of the Institute for Advanced Study, I'm always talking about the Institute for Advanced Study. Now, many of you know that Robert Oppenheimer directed the Los Alamos Laboratory Site Y of the Manhattan Project that created the uh, atomic bomb. Some may not know that after that, he went on to serve almost 20 years as director of the Institute for Advanced Study, making the Institute at that time, 1947 forward, home to two of the most recognizable physicists on the planet, Albert Einstein because of all of his hair, and Robert Oppenheimer because of the bomb. In the popular imagination, Einstein came to represent unalloyed optimism about the capacity of human genius to uncover the secrets of the cosmos. Oppenheimer played a grimmer role, standing for the dangers of atomic energy in particular and of advancing technology in general. So Oppenheimer and the atom bomb provides a powerfully and today frequently invoked, the New York Times I think every week makes the comparison between say Sam Altman and Robert Oppenheimer, a powerful allegory for the present when the world is once again worried that a new technology threatens the future of humanity. Advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence have provoked attention to questions that were once the province of science fiction. Might artificial intelligence programs go rogue and enslave or eliminate humanity? Or less apocalyptically, will AI take over our jobs, our decision making, our economies, our governments? How can we ensure that the new technologies work for rather than against the values and interests of humanity? So to answer this last question, which is, I think, very much a question our panelists are concerned with, the most important part of Oppenheimer's life isn't the part that he spent working on the atomic bomb, but his less dramatic tenure running the Institute. Oppenheimer, Einstein, uh, John von Neumann, and other Institute faculty channeled much of their efforts in the late 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way into the 80s when Freeman Dyson wrote um, uh, what, you, what were they called, Weapons of Hope, something like that, his, his book of 84, uh, toward what AI researchers today call the alignment problem, how to make sure our discoveries serve us instead of destroying us. And their approach to this increasingly pressing problem remains instructive. So I'd like to speak for just two minutes about what it teaches us. So von Neumann focused on applying the powers of mathematical logic taking insights from games of strategy and applying them to economics and war planning. Today, descendants of his game theory, running on descendants of his von Neumann computing architecture, are applied not only to our nuclear strategy, but also to many parts of our political, economic, and social lives. This is one approach to alignment. Humanity survives technology through more technology, and it's the researcher's role to maximize progress. 
As director, Oppenheimer agreed that technological process, progress was important. And in fact, he gave von Neumann so much money for his computer that the other faculty complained. They even complained that the computer scientists were getting more sugar allotment for their tea than the others. But as an intellect, he also thought this approach was not enough. Here's a quote. What are we to make of a civilization, he asked in 1959, just a few years after von Neumann's death, what are we to make of a civilization which has always regarded ethics as an essential part of human life and which has not been able to talk about the prospect of killing almost everybody except in prudential and game theoretical terms? So he championed another approach. He was convinced, and here's another quote, that the safety of a nation or the world cannot lie wholly or even primarily in its scientific or technical prowess. If humanity wants to survive technology, he believed, it needs to pay attention not only to technology, but also to ethics, religions, values, forms of political and social organization, and even feelings and emotions. So he set out to make the Institute a place capable of thinking about humanistic subjects like Russian culture, medieval history, that's my field, so I had to mention it, or ancient philosophy, as well as about mathematics and the, history and the, and the, and the theory of the atom. So today, we need to be reminded that no alignment of technology with humanity can be achieved through technology alone. For example, many people are worried that the application of complex and non-transparent machine learning algorithms to human decision-making in areas like criminal justice, hiring, and health care will invisibly entrench existing uh, inequalities and discriminations. Computer scientists can address this problem, and many are currently working on algorithms to increase fairness. But to design a fairness algorithm, as they're called, we need to know what fairness is. Fairness is not a mathematical constant or even a variable. It's a human value, meaning that there are many often competing and even contradictory visions of it on offer in all of our societies at any given time. Preserving any human value worthy of the name will require not only a computer scientist, but also a sociologist, I'm looking at you, Alondra, a psychologist, a political scientist, a philosopher, a historian, a theologian. Oppenheimer even brought T.S. Eliot, a poet, uh, here to, to help meet the challenges of the future. If there's anyone who can help us bring the technological and the human together, it's Alondra Nelson the Harold F. Linder Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, and uh, a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, an acclaimed scholar of the social dimensions of science and technology and their implications for democracy and civil and human rights. Dr. Nelson's publications include The Social Life of DNA and Technicolor, Race, Technology, and Everyday Life. A former deputy assistant to President Joe Biden, Nelson served as acting director and principal deputy director for science and society of the White House Office of Science and Technology, OSTP. She was the first person, you see, when I talk about government, I always have to go back into acronyms. She was the first person to serve in this latter role, bringing a social science perspective to bear on federal science and technology, strategy, and policy. At OSTP, she led a team writing the landmark blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights that lays groundwork, both principles and practice, for industry, policymakers, legislators, regulators, and technology developers to safeguard people's rights and opportunities as algorithms and AI reach further into our lives. Including, in her, including her in its international list of 10 people who shaped science in 2022, nature, said of Dr. Nelson's White House tenure, this social scientist made strides for equity, integrity, and open access. There's a lot more to say about Alondra and the strides she is making, but I won't delay further the main event. Please join me in welcoming to the stage my colleague Alondra Nelson. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, David, for that thoughtful um, introduction that really brought today's conversation to the site and the place of where many of us are sitting here in Wilfinson Hall and Princeton, New Jersey. Um, thank you all for being here in the room and for joining us online. 
So as David mentioned, I, I served two years um, uh, in the Biden-Harris administration. Before I left IAS to go and take on that role, I was working on a book about the office I would go to uh, serve a role in, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And the book was a sort of history of the office, which was established in 1976. And it was also a, a kind of case study of the Obama administration's eight years um, uh, of endeavor in science and technology policy. What was really interesting about the history of the office um, is that it was set up to offer guidance to the president on a range of issues in science and technology um, across a, a domain, the domains of um, d both domestic and international issues. It was also meant in the statute from 1976 to encourage positive developments, socially beneficial, pro-social benefits in science and technology, while, and this is almost verbatim from the statute, mitigating the foreseeable risks to society. So 1976, 40 years later in 2016, um, after the, 40 years after the founding of OSTP, that mission of both um, understanding that any progress forward, any pro-social outcomes from science and technology development uh, needed to come with risk mitigation and a, and a real sort of gimlet-eyed, sort of clear-headed approach to values um, in the way that we do our work, would be encapsulated in the words of President Barack Obama in one of his last international trips um, of his time in office. So this is from 2016. Speaking at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park in Hiroshima, Japan, he would say, quote, uh, excuse me, quote, technological progress without an equivalent progress in human institutions can doom us. The scientific revolution requires a moral revolution as well. So this is the challenge that we continue to face. We often think about science and technology as the hard part. We think about the technical facets of tools like artificial intelligence as the difficulty. But moving from aspirations like human and democratic values to institutions, concepts, policies, and practices is arguably more challenging. How do we move to, um, as David was suggesting, and our colleague Brian Christian, who will meet uh, soon, wrote about um, uh, in his recent book, an alignment of technologies and values that is not solely technology-facing or technology-dependent. I've come to think of this as um, moving from alignment or the alignment problem to seeking uh, to build out thick alignment. So another colleague uh, here in the School of Social Science at the IAS that David didn't mention was Clifford Geertz, um, known in the social scientists for his concept of thick, thick description. Thick description that deals with context, with power, with explanation, with incentive structures. How do we ensure that the public is included in policies and, in, and the assumptions that we make about the public good. This, I want to suggest, is the work of thick alignment. Over the past three days, as David said, um, I've been immensely grateful to an interdisciplinary, cross-sector, um, transatlantic group of scholars and colleagues who came almost on the turn of a dime, knowing that we as a research community, as a policymaking community, needed to begin to have conversations and to I make, make some progress um, on these issues. From the worlds of policy, business, civil society, and research, we've been meeting here um, in a working group on artificial intelligence policy and government. Uh, governance. I want to take a moment just to thank the IAS team for all that they did to make that possible. All of the flights, all of the food, all of the accommodations um, in the course of a couple of weeks' time. I'm immensely, we're all immensely grateful for your efforts. Among our prevailing questions since we've been gathering since Sunday has been how to confront the spectrum of harms and risks already facing us with regard to artificial intelligence. Destabilization of the employment sector, and in worker experience, that kind of worker experience that grounds our lives. I mean, it is the thing that gives us identity, identity. it gives the thing that gives us structure to our days. How do we imagine a world in which um, that might not be possible unless we make some um, wise decisions? A world in which bias and discrimination is already being exacerbated through the use of technology as well as surveillance. The possibility of security vulnerability, sustainability issues, um, and the very erosion of democracy and public trust through the sort of expansion and, as, and um, exacerbating of misinformation and disinformation. And of course, looming um, further in the future, uh, a range of catastrophic outcomes and much more. How can we imagine and build the guardrails and policy infrastructure that can begin to help us steer artificial intelligence, which are tools for human use, in the direction of the benefit for human good? 
Strategies to ensure that AI tools are developed and used responsibly must be a fundamental part of the entire development process, of the life cycle of all of these technologies and tools that we're building. How do we achieve this, and what is the role of values like justice, democracy, and liberty in this pursuit? So I am pleased and honored that a few of the people who've been in this very special group over the last three days here in Princeton have agreed to extend our conversation this afternoon with a public audience. Um, we're going to have a conversation of about 40 minutes and then take question, uh, questions from um, the audience. Um, my colleagues here will have micro be passing a microphone in the aisle when that time comes. So allow me to introduce these colleagues and invite them up to the stage. Miranda Bogan formerly served as policy manager for artificial intelligence and machine learning at Meta, leading work at the intersection of policy and AI, AI fairness. Prior to joining Meta, Miranda was senior policy analyst at Upturn in Washington, D.C., and was co-chair of the Fairness, Transparency, and Accountability Working Group at the Partnership on AI. She holds a master's degree from the Fletcher School, uh, where she focused on international technology policy issues, and she's a graduate of UCLA, where she studied political science and Middle Eastern and North African studies. Miranda. Brian Christian is an acclaimed author, please come on up, is an acclaimed author and researcher whose work explores the human implications of computer science. He's best known for his best-selling series of books, including most recently, The Alignment Problem, Machine Learning and Human Values. Brian's writing has been uh, translated into 19 languages and has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Wired, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The Paris Review, and in scientific journals, including Cognitive Science. He holds degrees in philosophy and computer science and poetry uh, from Brown University and the University of Washington, and he's a visiting scholar both at UC Berkeley and the University of Oxford, Brian. Sorel Friedler is the Shibulal Family Associate Professor of Computer Science at Harborford College. She served as the Assistant Director for Data and Democracy in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Biden-Harris Administration, where her work included the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Her research focuses on fairness and interpretability of machine learning algorithms with applications for ranging from criminal justice to materials discovery. She is co-founder of the ACM Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, and has done research and received grants in the areas of machine learning, fairness, social networks, uh, and policy, um, and, and as well as discriminatory um, machine learning. Her work has been featured in the IEE Spectrum, NBC News, The Guardian, Bloomberg, and NPR. Before uh, be joining the faculty of Haverford College, Sorrell was a software engineer at Google, where she worked in the X Lab. She holds a PhD in computer science from Maryland and a BA from Swarthmore. Uh, Sorrell, welcome. And William Isaac is a computational social scientist and a senior staff research scientist on DeepMind's ethics and society team, and my co-conspirator over the last three days with a few others. He is also a research affiliate um, at the University of Oxford Center for the Governance of AI and an advisory board member of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. His research focuses on fairness and governance of AI systems. Prior to joining DeepMind, he served as an Open Society Foundation's fellow and research advisor for the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. His research has been featured in Science, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. He has a PhD in political science from Michigan State. Dr. Isaac, welcome. So join me in welcoming these uh, colleagues. So, um, as I said, grateful to all of the colleagues, but particularly these because we've been kind of huddled in a room together for three days, and I know they're exhausted. Uh, so they're giving you their last gaps, <laughs> gasps of brilliance, and we're grateful to them for that. So let's um, start with, I think, the kind of human values and public goods question, which I think brings us here today. And, you know, a, a series of questions, and I would ask you just to come, to come at them any way you'd like to. So how do we think about who the public is with regards to sort of expert complicated systems like AI, who should have a say in their governance, who should have a say in creating value systems or thinking about value systems around them, how can we ensure that human values, the public good, guide the development and deployment of these tools, and how do we best determine that kind of relationship between values uh, and tools? So I'd offer that to all of you and whoever wants to, to get us started. I can kick it off. <laughs> um, you know, I think those, those of us on the panel, but anyone watching who's worked in the space of building technology knows that um, 
talking to potential users and actual users of technology is a standard, pretty standard practice um, and continues to be even in the case of AI. Um, I think that's an important sense of who is the public, but an, you know, another important part of that is who is interacting with those people who might be affected by the use of a technology even if they don't choose to use a technology or don't know that they're using a technology. And I think an important challenge in this time is to expand the notion of who a user is um, as folks are building this technology in order to integrate their perspective and, and the potential impacts on the, them and their community into the technology up front. So that's, I think, the first facet. But I think we also have to build longer term uh, mechanisms, you know, m uh, forums, uh, spaces like these for people who aren't traditionally in those spaces. Um, and after technology has been deployed to continue learning um, what is happening and uh, how technology should be updated and how we should be making decisions as we learn about uh, the impacts that may not have been anticipated. I think another important sense of who is the public is also when is the public? Are we just thinking about ourselves today? Um, there are a lot of people who have not been thought about enough today, but there are also our children, potentially you know, uh, future generations, and I think a debate that we were having on our, uh, in our conversations this past few days and one that's playing out in the broader um, public conversation is, are we thinking extremely long term such that we need to be worried about very low likelihood but very high impact things that may happen and may, may impact future people? Or do we need to focus on us today because there are real harms happening now? And I think where we landed was probably a little bit of both. Um, we can't forget one at the expense of the other. Um, we need to be thinking about the people today who haven't, whose voices haven't been heard, but also think about what do we need to take into account over time that we might not be anticipating right at this moment? One way that I would come at this question is by thinking about what are the main techniques that are used in practice today at a, at a very kind of applied level. And the set of techniques that has become predominant in the last couple of years is called reinforcement learning from human feedback or RLHF. Um, and the basic idea here is that you start with a model that has simply been trained on to do next word prediction on a huge corpus of text from, you know, collected from the internet and elsewhere. Um, and then you take this system and you change its output to be producing text that a panel, essentially a panel of raters or essentially a focus group, uh, likes these outputs better than some other outputs. Um, and often these people are uh, essentially contract workers in various parts of the world, typically where labor is very inexpensive. Um, and so starting from this point, I think there's two ways that human values end up into these systems. The first is uh, that the system takes in, in effect, the values of the people who wrote all of the texts on which the model is initially trained. And that gives us an opportunity to think about inclusion of languages that are not as well represented on the internet or people from communities um, that don't have a strong written tradition or are not uh, as, as widely spoken. Uh, and think about ways that those people might be unintentionally disenfranchised by not being part of this model from the beginning. Um, and then we can also think about, well, who are these people that we were asking to do these rating tasks and to prefer one output to another? Um, we think about, it's sort of framed as a, as a low wage job, but it's also a form of enfranchisement. These are people, you know, having their say. And so the, are there ways to rethink or reconceptualize the act of sort of participating into these models and getting to, you know, cast your vote, so to speak, over what you think they should be doing? Um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done on both sides uh, to just be more deliberate and more thoughtful uh, about whose opinions are, are ultimately getting their way into the final system. Let's come back to that, because I want to talk about labor a little bit, but Sorrel and, and William. Yeah, so I, I agree with a lot of what Miranda was saying earlier about the importance of thinking about existing evaluation systems um, and where they fall short, um, but also where those existing practices, you know, which are already systematized, can really be expanded in ways that are useful, right? So I think you know, bringing more people into that process, having a broader understanding 
of what it means to be impacted by these systems, um, what it means to be a user, right? I think that's no longer even quite the right language. Um, but I think also, you know, sort of <laughs> dialing back to our traditional software engineering testing protocols, I think, you know, even just thinking really more carefully about the metrics that we're testing for and making sure to incorporate aspects of demographic groups and other notions of, di of difference to make sure that everyone is being served well by these systems. The other thing that I, I want to sort of push back on a little bit um, is, you know, I think that while a lot of the large language models are getting a lot of attention right now, they're actually not the predominant model that is impacting people, right? There are a lot of um, smaller models from, you know, that have not been <laughs> trained in gigantic data centers by gigantic companies, but that are still really impacting people um, every day, right? In areas in employment and in housing, right? Um, and, you know, these are, simpler models in a certain sense, right? But that doesn't lessen their impact, and we still need to do a really, a much better job of evaluating that impact and trying to prevent some of the negative ones. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think the, the kind of like, I mean, I think to Sorrell's point, I mean, there are the kind of common problem that we have is how do we govern algorithmic systems that make decisions in real world and consequential settings? And, you know, I think kind of looking across the panel, I think there is this kind of like interesting set of places where we think the public comes in. So one is in the kind of like, you know, generation of the input data that we use to design algorithms. Another one is in how we evaluate them. And then I think to Brian's point, there's a question of how we try to like calibrate or align them. In each of these processes, these are decision points. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm concerned about is often that this is happening in a very opaque fashion. So one of the things that we've talked about a lot is how do we provide greater access? So how do we think about not just having the organizations or governments who design these systems actually play a role in shaping these decisions, but that there are other stakeholders that need to be involved, like the actual public, right? And this can come in many forms. This can come in the form of providing direct access, or I think for maybe for a slightly technical term, or APIs, where you have limited access to uh, the machinery and the, and the algorithms themselves and be able to assess them. And so these questions about how we kind of access systems is going to be critically important because ultimately these sets of decisions are going to be made. And I think as everyone pointed out, they are going to play a role not just for small use cases, but for many parts of the world. And so how we have mechanisms by which people can assess these things independently are going to be really critical if we actually want the public to play a role in shaping what the future of these systems will actually look like. Thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit, Brian queued us up, I think, to talk about the, the labor issues. And you know, part of the concerns, of course, are about the potential for labor displacement. I mean, we've had concerns you know, for 100 years about automation and what that means. And I think um, the, um, that the, the sort of jury on that, or, you know, is, or, or the decision on that is kind of mixed. I mean, sometimes disruption creates lots of new kinds of industries and new jobs. That might be the case with both the AI that's, um, that we're more familiar with, the smaller models and the bigger models to come, or something besides might happen. As I mentioned in my, op my opening remarks, we also have to think about that work is a social role and it gives people anchors and communities and other sorts of identities. That's important. And then we have the issue of, I really appreciate it, I haven't thought about um, the colleagues who are doing the reinforcement learning as sort of having input in the process. But of course, you know, workers working for big companies, I think that's a, there's a kind of structural relationship in which they both do and don't have, like, I don't know if you used the word enfranchisement, or you said something mm -hmm. like a voice or empowerment or something. So I wanted just to talk through kind of some sets of, of labor issues, whoever wants to take them up, and, and how do we think about, you know, A, how these tools are impacting right now, recruitment, hiring, those sorts of things, and how they might impact um, you know, the sort of present and future of employment. So whoever wants to sort of take that up. Um, I'll start this time. Yeah, 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 so I think, I mean, I think this is going to be a hugely consequential question. And I think to, to Brian's point earlier, I think, you know, we tend to think about what are the impacts of AI as kind of displacement of the kind of end use, but there are going to be any kind of labor questions along the kind of development, right? So one of the things that's been very common, commonly discussed in terms of generative models for image generation, for example, has been about the role of artists in creative communities, right? Their input data is often being used to train and calibrate these models, and they don't necessarily receive any compensation for what comes out on the other end. 
right? And so I think to the early point about reinforcement learning with human feedback, right? I mean, they are enfranchised, but obviously the kind of value in exchange for the kind of contributions they're making to calibrate the model is always in an imbalance. So there's a question of like, if I'm participating in helping calibrate this very powerful AI system, um, what is my role in that? How does that, how does that net out? And then, of course, on the other side, right, um, we do have decisions and choice about how we deploy these powerful AI systems, right? We can choose to make them ones that augment human capability rather than displacing them, right? So it's a conscious choice that we're making about how to situate them in our society. And unfortunately, there tends to be an imbalance of uh, using them to kind of automate out labor rather than augmenting and empowering labor. And seeing those are going to be really important questions. I'm setting the table if everyone can dive in in more detail. But I think at a very high level, these are the kind of along the pilot, and we should be thinking not just about one part of it, but across all different parts of what we think AI will inevitably bring as a kind of like ecosystem rather than as a specific technical artifact. Yeah, and, and I think part of that ecosystem that I think is going to be really important is, you know, again, as you nicely laid out, um, these systems are already have a sort of human input component. Mm -hmm. We can't really expect that that's going to go away anytime soon, right? Um, so humans have a part to play in creating the data that goes into the system. Um, they also necessarily have a part to play in correcting the system when it goes wrong, right? In, in serving as that um, you know, sort of fail safe um, when the system either doesn't know what to do, right? Or um, makes an error. We've seen this already, for example, with self-driving cars, right? Um, more than a decade ago, I got to ride in a self-driving car. Uh, and you know, there were predictions then that we were all going to be riding in them all the time. Um, why didn't that happen, right? Well, it's, you know, it's because of that sort of <laughs> last mile, if you will, problem um, <laughs> of seeing that, you know, okay, there's a construction zone here, right? And, and that wasn't expected. Um, now, what do we do? Well, you know, we throw it back to the person who's supposed to be sitting there ready to take over at a moment's notice, right? That person is really key, and that person is going to remain key in a lot of these systems, which I think raises for me the question of, you know, what do those jobs look like, right? Um, can, can we make them jobs that are worthwhile such that they actually are a worthwhile sort of replacement for some of the other job displacement that will happen? Um, but I also want to point out that, you know, these various paths are not, um, that we have agency in determining what path we end up going down. And, you know, I think a great example of that is the current writer's strike, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, the question of AI as an employment issue is being directly decided. Sorrel pointed out uh, a few moments ago that, you know, that AI, of course, encompasses everything from these, you know, the most sophisticated, most cutting edge things to quite, quite in comparison, straightforward uh, applications of machine learning. But it, in some cases, they're, as consequential, or if not more consequential, I completely agree with that. And one of those domains is hiring itself. And so, you know, I would just add complementary to what everyone else has said that not only is AI raising questions about which jobs will exist or what those roles will look like, but it also is going to, it already does and will increasingly mediate how people find their way into those roles or not. Um, and there have been many. Uh, you know, well, well-known failure modes where uh, hiring algorithms essentially screen for people who resemble, in a superficial way, the people who were previously hired to fill those roles. Um, and so, if not done carefully, we could essentially automate these certain forms of discrimination. Um, and so, I think that's that's another piece of the puzzle is just thinking about how is AI mediating the job market in that way. And I want to pick up on some terminology that Sorrel used that I think is very important. She talked about systems. Um, often when we're talking, when you hear about AI in the news, um, or even in the case of employment, this has come up quite a bit, it can tend to be framed as AI is deciding this, um, or the model is doing that. And I think what's important to remember is in almost no case is an AI, a you know, unit of AI existing in a vacuum and you know, functioning in a way that doesn't interact with either other technical components or people. And so it's more helpful to think about AI as a system um, that integrates many different components as well as people and understand what role different 
components of that system and those people are playing. We talked over the last few days about, you know, we not only need to understand how the models and the technical uh, pieces of these systems are functioning and, and have accountability in that regard, but we also need to understand how people are using them and how they're understanding what might be conveyed about that system, whether through um, user interfaces or through other transparency mechanisms, some examples of, of uh, recommendations to make AI more transparent are, um, are ideas, called, for example, of things like model cards, like a data nutrition label, for example. Um, at Meta, when I was there, we uh, worked on the concept of system cards, which is to say there's not just one model and components of that model, but you also have to understand how different pieces work together um, so that you can better ask questions about where these impacts most likely um, will manifest and where are those social and societal and ethical decisions situated. Um, it's tempting to bundle it all into one idea of a system and have the technologists work and build all within that. But actually what we want to do in order to make these systems more approachable to people who are not building them is um, break them out into components so we can have the appropriate conversations with the appropriate people, the ethical conversations with you know, broader society, the technical conversations um, with the folks who can integrate those ideas into the technology. And so you know, if you could take away an idea of that, is when you see people saying the AI system did a thing, it's usually not just one system and it's usually not that system acting um, independently. So an example of that is in the context of hiring a few years ago when there were many concerns, when the concerns sort of emerged about the role technology was playing um, in hiring with automated decisions and whatnot, there were often characterizations that AI systems were deciding who was going to be hired and who was not going to be hired. But for anyone who's worked in recruiting, um, you, you know that hiring is a process. Um, there's a point of discovery about what jobs are even available or what might be of interest through all the way down to applying for the job, interviewing, making a selection. And what AI looks like at each of those points is different. How humans are involved in interpreting um, the output of a system is different at different points. If a system is ranking job candidates, usually there's a human sitting there being like, I'm going to call these five at the top of the list, or maybe seven, or coming up with their own ways to interpret what's coming out. So there are still humans involved, and doing a better job, I think, um, the research community and the practitioner community, but also the public, in pointing out how these systems are integrating into the world we know uh, so that we can better understand what we need to do about it will be really important in the coming years. So I want to linger here just for another moment and ask Sorel and Miranda, but um, um, certainly William and Brian jump in if you want, to help us think about kind of values like civil rights and civil liberties. So do, does the use of AI systems and AI tools, should it fundamentally change how we think about things like civil values like civil rights and civil liberties? On the one hand, um, some of Miranda's earlier comments, and you used the phrase updating, and you were talking about the system, but it is this sort of question about do we need to update our values or our value, you know, how do we think about the, the sort of social dynamics um, and social val and, and values in the kind of social sphere and the dynamics in that space vis-a-vis -vis sort of AI technologies? I think neither civil rights nor civil liberties are fully won. They're a process of continuing to fight for those rights. Um, and, and continued progress, hopefully. What AI has introduced to the conversation is several fold. One is that it maybe changes ways in which those rights in, manifest or don't manifest in society such that we need to update our way of thinking about what work is necessary in order to continue making positive progress. And also, it's giving society a very interesting opportunity to remember that these are things that we care about and figure out how we want to embed them into the technology that we're building. And while you know, AI is the theme of the conversation at the moment, AI is really a tool and a layer in many other conversations and gives us the opportunity to revisit those and think about what do we need to change now that we know that things are changing, but also what do we want to make sure we're protecting. And when we're talking about human values and values alignment, it's also, I think, an important thing to remember that we as a society in America are still debating a lot of these things, for better or worse, and 
there's not one thing that we need to align to. This will be a continued conversation and society will continue to change and morph. Um, and keeping that space open for that debate, for that conversation, so that we don't lock in, even if we lock in something that's better today than it was 50 years ago, that we don't lock in whatever happened today because what if in 50 years it could have been better if we left room for a continued improvement? Yeah, I, I think what I would add to that is that, you know, while we don't, um, while we don't need, you know, an entire reimagining of, of civil rights, what we do need are um, new tools to ensure those rights. Um, and I'm using tools really broadly here. I don't necessarily mean sort of technical objects, um, but new abilities to understand what's actually going on inside the black box, right? New mechanisms of transparency, um, you know, new abilities to ask companies to release information um, so that we can determine, you know, if some employment practice was discriminatory, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that sort of thinking through what those things look like, you know, I agree with Miranda, does sort of provide us with an opportunity to have that more public discussion about, you know, what is it that we're trying to achieve. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, in, the, in the sense of the public good, sort of the common, sort of common resources. So I'm thinking I want to talk about energy consumption um, and these large frontier models and the fact that they use... They need a lot of computational power, a lot of compute, and they use a lot of energy, such that it's been fascinating to watch outside of the sort of main big four or five companies in the space that there's a sort of market or there's some dynamics happening in which former, you know, computational power that was used for Bitcoin, you know, for, for Bitcoin and blockchain is now being turned to these other spaces. And part of the challenge that we faced, and this is something that we worked on, I worked on in the Biden-Harris administration, around policy making with regards to things like, like crypto, um, uh, cryptocurrency and digital assets was that they consume so much energy. And so how do we want to think about those kinds of resources as a, as a public good? And, um, and, and I don't know, what to, how, do we, how do we want to think about that? I don't, I'm not quite sure how else to say it. I'd be happy to, yeah. Yeah. to jump Maybe, in. Yes, yes. Um, so I think one of the things that I found really um, effective and, and positive actually about the cryptocurrency conversation was that there was actually a lot of transparency and public conversation about the amount of energy that the mining was taking, right? Um, and there were, you know, newspaper interactive stories about it, right? And people could sort of dive into the, into the data of the amount of energy that was being used and compare it to, you know, relevant metrics of, you know, total country consumption, right? Because it was on that scale. Um, I suspect that the energy usage of these AI models is on that similar scale, right? On the order of the consumption of a country. But we actually don't have the transparency in those cases, right? These companies haven't disaggregated their data center use to let us know, you know, how much of that is going to training this large language model. And so in my mind, that's the place where we really need to start. Because without knowing, you know, how big of a problem it is, it's really it's really hard to know what the next step should be. Anybody else want to weigh in? I mean, Brian, do you want to? There's if we think about kind of societal scale risk, quote unquote. Mm. Um, you know, the energy consumption piece is sort of an interaction with our climate change concerns and also um, sort of rogue, uh, you know, technology use concerns. And so that to me seems to be a place where you could have a compounding effect of kind of two large kind of risk concerns? Yeah, in some ways I think of climate change and AI risk mitigation as like quite similar in the sense that, um, you know, one of the things that AI safety people talk about is this alignment problem. Uh, often AI systems are given this explicit numerical objective which is designed to try to capture most of what we care about, but there's inevitably things that aren't expressed by that, that, you know, all bets are off. Um, and this, I think, is extremely uh, essentially identical to the problem of externalities um, in the economy. And so for better or worse, I view, I personally view climate change as an alignment problem, that mm -hmm. we have this sort of, you know, macro scale objective called, you know, maximize shareholder returns or GDP per capita or whatever it is. Um, but that doesn't include these things that are 
just as integral to the flourishing of human society, but they're harder to measure, they're harder to put a number on, it's harder to stick it into um, you know, this calculation. And so from my perspective, um, there's a very deep connection there. And I think it's also, you know, for people who are concerned about what, what will be the objective function that these powerful AI systems serve, one of the answers to that question is capitalism, because they are being developed by publicly traded companies um, that have this very clear shareholder objective um, that obviously is at conflict with, with the um, environment. Um, and so I think from that perspective, concerns of how do we mitigate you know, the harms of capitalism end up being surprisingly relevant to how do we make AI safe and vice versa. Thank you for that. I want to come back to you on the alignment problem, which is the name of uh, Brian's 2020 book, um, which I would recommend to you. It's, it's, um, uh, it's an excellent book. So it does that, that, that sort of metaphor, that framing, does a lot of different things in the book. So it's partly about the alignment of, of you know, machine learning and human values, which is the subtitle of the book. But you also sort of give us this entree and this journey through a lot of different communities that are both trying to work on that technical value problem and the different ways that they think about the values. And so how would you, how should we think about, I mean, and this is just a small, you know, relatively small set of the difficulty of, of the kind of thick alignment on the values piece. So based on the, these case studies that you've done, I mean, how should we think about um, the, how hard it is to think about values at the level of society, right? I mean, so this is obviously a truly unfair question, but, <laughs> yeah. but you know, part of what your book shows us is that is the struggle in just, commu you know, from an outsider, people would say, oh, these are all computer scientists and they're all really concerned with doing the best possible kind of CS that creates the best possible outcomes. Um, you know, um, but even there's dissension within what the values are that one is sort of working towards. And so um, I guess what's the lesson for us in sort of trying to think about a public good or sort of human values broadly? Or did you have pause in sort of putting human values in your subtitle? Like that's a big, that's a big case, a big set. Yeah, I, <laughs> and uh, I certainly is not an authoritative, comprehensive um, account of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think because the task is so daunting, I'm inclined to like begin my answer by highlighting something that I, I found surprisingly heartening, which is that you know, it has been one of the signature successes of machine learning going back to the early 2010s uh, in computer vision, that we went from an era where we were manually defining all of the aspects of an image that made something recognizable as a chair or a dog or whatever. And we've replaced this with a system that can just kind of holistically learn those features for itself. And I think there's a very interesting question here of, does that ability generalize into the domain of values? Um, and so this is one of the things that we've started to see with RLHF, where if you give someone two... Reinforcement learning with human Yeah, excuse value. me. Mm -hmm. um, where if you present someone with two pieces of text and you say, which of these do you prefer? where prefer could be as broad as I like the spelling better, I like the tone better, or I like the you know, world view being articulated better, um, that surprisingly these systems are able to uh, formulate some internal representation that most of us most of the time say seems to capture whatever we mean by this thing being better than the other, whereas be where better could be aesthetic, it could be moral and so forth. I find that very surprising, like it, there was no, it, that did not have to work, but it, it does seem to work to a first approximation. The hard part, I mean, the, for me the daunting question is that uh, there are many aspects of human values that are wildly heterogeneous, and so the mathematical approach that the community has tended to take is to just sort of assume that all human beings basically have the same set of values and we're going to treat it as like, you know, randomness and noise when they disagree. <laughs> Clearly, you know, the closer we ap approach, you know, questions of political salience, the more clearly we arrive at a situation where there are genuine differences of opinion. Uh, and so then we need to start thinking about, I mean, the last thing I'll just say is the computer scientists that I talk to who work on AI alignment, almost all of them are this year reading like political science textbooks. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about mechanisms for resolving disagreement, um, for 
you know, reaching consensus. And so I think that set of issues is increasingly coming to the, to the center of the stage. Mm. Thank you for that. So you, you told your sort of heartening story. What, what, others, what, what do you all find heartening about AI? Why do you work in this space? What, what, what's, the, what's the best case scenario? Are we there yet? Are we close? Uh, William? Okay, so I want to respond to Brian's point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Before yeah. I, I'll, well, I will answer your question. So one thing that's interesting about, you mentioned the point about computer vision, and, and, and one thing that's very interesting, there was a very famous study that was about maybe three or four years ago, and looked at kind of like, you know, um, you know, depictions of living rooms, and can computer vision systems identify objects in like living rooms? And what it found was that it was really good for doing this in like Western households, mm. but not in non-Western households. Right, because it had been trained on systems that it represented concepts of living rooms or what it, uh, comprises living rooms by what was in kind of Western households. Right? So like, even to your point, right, these systems are embedding values, but what values get embedded is also reflected inside of how the systems identify things. And the same thing with reinforcement learning with human feedback. Right? Obviously, these systems are calibrated to kind of Western norms and understanding of values. That's not always true for other values, right? And you can see that in the performance of systems where you get blocked or where you don't get blocked in terms of what you input into, you know, pick your language model. Uh, and so these are going to be important questions. And I think, you know, like the work that we've done at DeepMind, thinking about both rule-based approaches that and can, can transparently communicate how you use reinforcement learning with human feedback, but also embedding re participatory methods so you can have more stakeholders engage in the process of establishing these rules and guiding the way these systems behave. I do agree this will be the future. Um, I do think this question about what we actually have as good systems, I would say I think one underrated part about the kind of advancement of large models is actually for things like machine translation. I actually do think that there's been a lot of progress made in this and there could be a, a point in the near future where we have near instant like you know uh, translation between languages where people are speaking and this would be really useful for a lot of different domains both in the public sector and just broadly in society where you need to be able to communicate against lots of different groups and I think this also surprisingly not just works well for kind of predominant languages like English but also low resource languages as well so I think there's like a lot of optimism for using these kind of things to help us kind of advance society and many different spaces. Sorrel? Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of areas where um, AI systems are being used to do good things, right, for scientific discovery, for breast cancer diagnosis. Um, and I, I think in addition to being inspired by all of those good use cases, I'm especially heartened by the increasing recognition that these systems are not magic. Right? Yeah. That you know, we can't imagine that this system will be able to detect something that a whole suite of doctors could not detect, right? But that rather this is something that can help doctors do their job better, right? In cooperation with doctors, right? Sort of remembering that there needs to be that human expertise in the room and in the loop and you know, guiding the overall process. Um, you know, I think that, that recognition makes me heartened that we could um, get to a better place, right, where these systems can be genuinely helpful and not harmful. I think earlier you talked about thick alignment, and it made me think of the, you know, the pile of social issues uh, that continue to um, be things that we talk about as a, as a, a stack society. overflow. <laughs> yes, yeah. the ultimate stack overflow. <laughs> so I think how I think of AI and why it's exciting is because there are probably a lot of different challenges that can be helped by things being faster and easier and less expensive, um, which could leave room to actually tackle the m deeper, more important, more thorny issues because there's less distraction by the mundane things or the things that should be easy. It could even help us address some of the issues of the past, for example, you know, with civil rights, um, if we're able to embed the protections well enough in systems that are operating at a, at a wider scale, the system will be the, the system of society will be less reliant on individual enforcement by you know regulators in order to hopefully prevent you know by scaring people uh, the, uh, other people from engaging in discrimination. So there might be ways that it can raise the floor, but I I don't think like as as my fellow panelists said, I don't think it will and solve everything in the stack. Hopefully it will open up space. And I think the same goes for solving challenges with AI. As we were thinking about 
um, what steps do we need to recommend to uh, policymakers uh, around what to do today, um, what sort of transparency mechanisms, what sort of accountability mechanisms. I think what we recognized was there's probably not one thing that is the right thing to do now. There's probably a variety of things that will help raise the floor and open up space for spending time on the harder things that we need to discuss. So I think that trend hopefully will um, build and, and help with those discoveries, uh, maybe even help with the, the resource question. You know, I think there has been some instances of AI helping with um, with uh, discovering different compounds that might help with electric cars, for instance, or things like that. So some of those exciting things maybe will um, reinvigorate work that is, continues to be a slog in society. Um, and at the same time, it will cause challenges, but hopefully creating that space so we can discuss them. And then I think the impetus will be back on society to make sure the structures are in place to have the important conversations, regardless of whether AI has influenced that conversation or not, which is a separate problem entirely of, you know, do we have the societal support for the challenging problems of the day? Thank you for that. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, what we might advise policymakers to do. Some of whom are some of your policymakers or former policymakers. So what were some of your, I mean, at a high level kind of takeaways from the conversation? I mean, maybe I would start with you, Brian, because you didn't mm -hmm. come to the space as a policy person, per se. Right. No, um, no. And so what were your kind of, I think, sort of takeaways in the policy space? Is, is there hope for us? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, one of the things that I wrote in the book was, I believe alignment will be messy. Um, and I think in the computer science community, there's, there's a certain appetite for finding the really clever mathematical insight or algorithmic uh, you know, process that's going to make these systems safe. Um, whereas in the law, I think there's a much deeper embrace of a sort of multi-layered, multi-agency, multi-step process. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's the sort of approach that I think the problem requires and demands of us. And so some of it will be solved through computer science, some of it will be solved through regulatory requirement, through audits, through product recalls, through tort law. I think it, I think it will require a little bit of everything and it will look untidy, but I think that's how we get there. Thanks for that. So we're gonna go to questions. I'm gonna ask everyone to answer this question about what they would recommend and, and then um, if you get your questions ready, Susan will bring the mic to you. I think one of the main takeaways it seemed that we uh, came to was that there are a lot of open questions. The research community, the technical and sociological community doesn't have answers waiting on a shelf for what we should do. This is a big and complex area, but we shouldn't let the fact that we don't have those answers stop us from doing something and trying to figure out what do we know about what steps can be taken now, recognizing that we might have to revisit those as we learn more about how effective those interventions were or how systems are operating in a way that might not have been expected. But something can be done and we can start now and begin the process. This will be a multi-decade process of, of understanding how technology and you know this new technology is going to shift and change. Um, and Government has dealt with that before, and we've never waited to know the full answer to get started. I find the sector-specific approach um, to be really helpful when thinking about policy. That's how a lot of policy is already organized, right? Um, you know, we have health and human services to think about health-related concerns and Department of Labor to think about employment-related concerns and so on. And, you know, I think that in all of those government agencies and also at the state level, there are real experts who understand all of the nuances of that specific domain. Um, and I, you know, I think that we really need to rely on that expertise and also you know, give them the additional technical support that they need um, to continue to make rules and have oversight in those areas. Um, I want people who are experts in health, right, who are doctors, making decisions about what medical AI devices can be used. I actually don't want computer scientists <laughs> in a room somewhere doing that. Um, I'm a computer scientist, and I'm definitely not a medical doctor, right? And so you know, I think that that expertise, having that expertise 
beliefs in the room is really important. And in government, we already have a lot of a lot of that expertise. Um, and so I think supplementing that with you know a small amount of technical expertise can go a long way. Yeah. So I think uh, building on this point, I think uh, it's one of the things that I think has uh, been uh, kind of conflated in the kind of like uh, kind of recent uh, news and discussion around. Uh, large AI systems is we kind of like uh, mesh together this kind of concept of these large models um, with the kind of like sectoral or kind of specific use cases. And one thing I would love to see is a kind of separation between these. Um, not just because there's a separation of who is, who is accountable and who is responsible for ensuring that they're safe and, and that they have a kind of uh, um, uh, some guarantees or assurances about their performances, but also the kind of specific questions that we're asking about. Um, if you're looking at a model that has a wide range of tasks and you're responsible for, um, the things that you would do from an evaluation standpoint would be very different if you're looking at a specific application in health or in law. Um, but I think overlying that is like a kind of demand for disclosure. Right? Many organizations who are developing or releasing these systems are doing forms of evaluation and, and data collection, and it'd be really useful to disclose this. And I think the government and policymakers can play a really important role of kind of making sure this information is available. And I think that by doing that, we can have better standards. Right? By pushing up the standards collectively, I think that will lead to safer systems overall and I think build public trust, which I think inevitably I think we want to see. And I think that would be a really good first step in terms of thinking about what is a good kind of policy infrastructure. Uh, but my own selfish plea, and given the setting here, I think really an investment in research would be really critical. I mean, there's a lot of aspects to these questions, both on their impact in terms of the behavior of these systems, but also the kind of ways in which human beings are going to be using these in many different parts of society are really important questions that are underexplored right now. And if this is going to be a facet of our social lives and many parts of our social infrastructure, we really need to have a deep understanding of this. And this is something that comes from a wider range of fields, including social science. Right? And I think this will be an important next step if we're going to have this be a kind of critical part of our future. Thank you all so much um, for your uh, for, for participating in this conversation, for your collaboration. Thank you all for being here and join me in. in